Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce the final speaker of today, um, Dr. Ignacy Guardans. Um, we've already seen him on the panel discussion today, so I'll, I'll try and keep his introduction brief. Uh, Dr. Ignacy Guardans is the chairman of uh, Kumidai, which is the culture and media agency for Europe, and former member of the European Parliament. Uh, Dr. Guardans has um, pursued higher education in the field of law and received a PhD in law after completing his doctoral research on comparative cases of laws and embargoes and their effect on the, the validity and enforcement of international trade contracts in developing countries. Dr. Guardans began his political activity in 1995, running for election in the Catalan Parliament, where he served shortly before moving to national politics in the Spanish Parliament, where he was elected within the CDC in two consecutive terms. In June 2004, he was elected to the European Parliament, where he joined the uh, ALDE group, the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats. In 2009, following several debates with the leadership of his party on the status of Catalonia within Spain, he left his party and has since remained an independent political figure. Dr. Guardan subsequently held the p position of Director General of the Spanish Institute for Cinematography and Audiovisual Arts within the Spanish Ministry of Culture until October 2010. Today he will be speaking about culture and cultures, identity and diversity as a force of growth and progress. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Ignacy Guadans. Thank you, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share some thoughts and comments with you. It's the end of a long day. Some of you survived, so I need to start thanking those of you who survived and who are still in the room. I also, of course, thank those who decided to go out, but at least those of you who are going to share these, and I think we might have a small debate or exchange of views after, after these thoughts. I intend to share with you a couple, of, a couple of ideas around one single principle. Culture and the diversity of culture is in itself a source of growth. But to have it as a source of growth, you do need to have this diversity. Without it, you do not have any benefit coming out of culture, or at least it is reduced at an extreme and very important amount. And this is important, of course, for developed countries, but it's particularly important, and that's the message I'm trying to transmit for developing countries. So I'm gonna talk about culture in not, not in terms of sort of empty word, but mostly about what some people call the creative economy culture as cultural industries, culture as effective production of cultural expressions. Of course, under the word culture, and today we've been using that in that way, and, and all these expression of cultural diplomacy, in some cases we're using culture in a very, very large way, in meaning like, well, anything which relates to the way, to the way people behave or to the way people communicate. Fully respect that terminology, but that's not what I'm using here. I'm referring to culture as expressions of culture, which means culture and the arts, which means publishing, which means any manifest, manifestation or demonstration coming out of the creativeness by the human being as it is translated, communicated, shared, shared by others and turned into a social thing. Well, it might be a clear thing for you as in general principle that yes, that behind culture there is growth. Of course, we could also talk, and I refer to a question which was put to the person who was talking here before, uh, growth also in terms of spiritual growth, growth in terms of ethical growth, and others. And I don't neglect that at all. But I'm going to talk mostly about economic growth, about the impact of culture on economic growth and therefore on the impact of supporting culture, promoting culture, exporting culture, and working on that as a source of real and practical economic growth, growth of jobs. And after that, we, at least I believe, and I guess you believe also, that of course economic growth is not the only way for a society to grow, uh, to grow up. Of course there are other things, there are values, there are many other things, but indeed, a very basic request for social progress has to do with economic development. I think we can agree with that. Well, the point here is that cultural growth and cultural development has a very strong and narrow relationship 
with that sort of growth, and one which is not underlined enough at all in many cases, especially when we are talking about development. So culture is not only a point for internal development or for internal personal uh, development as, as humans. In fact, the Nazi period showed us that culture in itself doesn't mean better condition as humans. You can be an assassin and the coldest assassin and be an extremely well cultivated person and just play Wagner or play and, and read the amazing, amazing novels huh, while we are sh you are shooting people from your window. So I am not among those who believe that just culture makes us better or things of that sort. You will never hear that from anything I, I can say. I do believe that culture can or not, but it can increase those dimensions as humans, but indeed, and that's my point here, it is an essential contributor to the GDP, to the gross domestic product of a country. You might be surprised that, in general, I mean, and a calculation done in 2010 by, I can so quote you the source, huh? the total of creative industries altogether, which again, we can define it grosso modo as the translation into some sort of economical activity coming out of the human spirit, literature, design, crafts making, dance, theater, music, all sorts of that, represented in the European Union in 2008, 4.5 of the total GDP. 4.5 of the total GDP is a greater contribution from culture than what the plastic industry represents, 2.3, or real estate economy represents, which is 2.1. So let's start with that figure. The total growth and the total part of GDP of activities coming out of the spirit music, I mean, economic activities, people many mo making money out of songs, out of dance, out of folklore festivals, out of film distribution, out of publishing, all that together is much larger, much larger than the contribution of food, beverage, and tobacco, 1.9, the textile industry, 0 0.5, chemicals, rubber, and plastic, 2.3, or real estate activities, 2.1. So that should be in itself something to start thinking that when we are talking about development and sustainable development and we are talking about what we can bring in that context, culture is an element. And therefore, cultural diplomacy meaning reinforcing that and not only using, because cultural diplomacy we could discuss, and of course you, you know more than I do, but uh, we can discuss on that word. It's culture as an instrument for diplomacy, but it's also diplomacy of culture. That's also cultural diplomacy. Huh? It's also the instrument and diplomacy used as an instrument to promote culture. But we could have a long debate on that. In any case, these, these figures are very important to consider. And these figures do not include, do not include, I'm excluding from this, another dimension of culture which in itself is huge, which is culture and tourism. I'm not including those figures in the, the, what contributes cultural heritage as such and the tourism which is linked to something more than sunbathing. Huh? That element as an attraction for culture and what is bringing is not included in this figure. If we look to different uh, figures, which could be very long, uh, we, could, we could start talking about cultural heritage, what it, what it brings, not only in terms of, as I said, attraction of tourism, but what it brings as an industry around protection, technology applied to that, everything which is around renovations and so on, about or around the purely, uh, the, the, what we consider in general cultural heritage. Of course, on music, that's the most obvious case, hmm? the most obvious case of what it can bring. Huh? The model is changing, we know that from CDs we're coming to the online music, that's another debate. Hmm? But it has a very clear, uh, important uh, dimension. I mention, of course, which is now in the hands of a very few. That's another issue. I'm not talking about how distributed that is. And in fact, if we see music from the perspective of the developed world, 
that applies in general to cultural industries, but to music is very particularly clear. It's that the situation, it's uh, the developing world, sorry, uh, the situation for many countries is very similar to what happens with the natural resources. They need to import their natural resources. So they need to, they export it as raw, and then they need to re-import it as developed, because there's no recording industry in most countries. So music from many African countries needs to go to Paris, be recorded in Paris by singers, and they need to pay for their own, and they need to, to import uh, most African countries, they need to import their own music if they want to listen to it, because it has been recorded uh, externally in, any, in some other countries. They don't have, and nobody, and those who are supporting them have never thought on the importance which can be in to develop local creative industries so that they can benefit in the same way they are doing with the natural resources from their own heritage. That would be for music, uh, visual arts, of course, uh, well, the figures on visual arts are very difficult to manage because, you know, some paintings change, uh, I mean, some, some arts uh, are, are evaluated in a way which is very difficult to, to take anything serious out of that. Indeed, on audiovisuals, on everything which is cinema, that's a very, uh, a most clear element because it's almost the engine, it's the most clear engine of everything which we call um, creative industries. Behind cinema there's also music, there's also drawing, there's also design and everything. We know that 80% of all the films shown worldwide are Hollywood productions, so that makes uh, this a completely unbalanced uh, scheme. But it is it is a very important, and then we could go for literature and printed media, of course, and some, I mean, we are talking in Europe about 11 billion, sorry, worldwide, this 11 billion in 2002 to 19 billion uh, sales of books in 2009. So it's just a growing figures. Okay, I wouldn't want to, bo to bother you too much with figures. This is more, more about sharing ideas and trying to transfer mostly one idea. This contribution of growth, of culture to growth, is based on interior demand, obviously, mostly. Yeah? And partly of that is based on export, which of course, very obvious statement to explain here in Geneva, which is the basis for the World Trade Organization, anybody's export is somebody else's import. Yeah? So it would be, we could start checking who imports and who exports. The UNCTAD is a stride and has started a few years ago to try to put those figures in order, uh, who has a deficit and who has a superavit uh, in commercial terms, in terms of creativity and, and, and all those uh, elements around it. The point, the important point for that, what I'm trying to say in a more or less disordered way, is that if you want to export your culture, you need to be different from your neighbor. So only those who are prepared to sell and to export something which is different, which means a different music, a different, a different literature, a different dance, different cultural identity in some sort, are those who can make themselves a place because of the huge dominance, of course, of the Anglo-Saxon market behind that. So it is not true the principle that some people believe that only those things which are standardized, Anglo-Saxonized, uh, turned into the mainstream are the only ones who can go into the world market. That's not true. That's not true at all. Of course, in some cases is, and suddenly some cultural creators and those supporting the distribution of those cultural, that cultural content can go easily into the world market, world circuit, just by pretending to be American or by disguising themselves as Americans. But that's not mostly the case. That's the case in, ma in many cases that just represents that you fall into sort of anonymity. On the contrary, it is when you don't hide what you are, where you come from, your own identity, that you can find your place, bigger or smaller, now becoming progressively bigger through the new channels, which are the internet channels, which allows your demand of dance, of others, of music, of literature to find uh, to find you and for you and and to eventually pay for seeing you, watching you, enjoying what is coming from that element of creation. So that that's also meaning that those countries 
who are uh, supporting their own creativity are also creating, of course, internal demand. And I will give a couple of examples of that. So countries who suddenly believing that what it is a modern way to develop as a society is just to get rid of your culture and lead it to the, cult, to the purely market forces, especially if it's a weak society with an originally weak culture, they are killing themselves. They are shooting themselves into the feet. Those countries who understand that they are not only reinforcing their identity as a country and their common feeling and social feeling and social cohesion through supporting their own culture and or some specific elements of that common culture, those who are able to do that, and, and we'll give you a couple of examples of that, uh, they are not only being able, of course, to export, as I was saying before, uh, but also to reinforce the internal demand, which means they are turning culture into a very important part of their own economy, of their own industry, of their own job creation, and so on. Hmm? Very obvious, I'm advancing something I was going to say later. Very obvious case, not to talk about developing countries, but, but, but closer to us, is Poland with its cinema, for example. Huh? Poland, immediately after the fall of the Berlin Wall, decided that, of course, what was, I mean, really cool, what was the best way to enter into the Western world was to have Hollywood films all around. And, you know, Polish cinema meant sort of ex-communist cinema, so it was not interesting at all. It, they really wanted to be as Westerner as possible. So they just got rid of any film supporting instrument they had around, and they considered those were things of the past, or things of sort of interventionist Soviet style. Huh? God bless ultra-liberalism was the motto in Poland at those days. And suddenly they started saying that Czech Republic, I mean Czechoslovakia at the very start, and then the Czech Republic and Slovakia, and of course other countries, not only were watching their own movies, but they were making money out of it. So the, money, the, the government changed in Poland, and in Poland they decided to set up the Polish Film Fund, which is not based on public money. It's a much more complicated structure. It takes part of its money from the box office. It's, a, it's the French model. So it's, it's the box office which pays for Polish films, plus a sort of tax. It's not exactly a tax, but almost a tax on telecoms and on broadcasters and so on. But they reorganized that. They returned to the model they had completely got, gotten rid of, and now, Polish films in Poland are between 20 and 30 percent of the internal box office. And they are starting to export a little bit of that. But that's it. they are creating a huge amount, of, I mean, in terms of, of proportion of what they are, and it is, of course, also bringing a new perspective of what they are. Because arts, I'm only talking now on this economic dimension, but of course, arts and culture at the end of the day, are just a mirror of what we are, of what each society is, of our dreams, of our fears, of what makes us laugh, what makes us love, what makes us cry. That's what culture is, and all those cultural exchanges are. So when a country recovers its identity and is able to transform that cultural identity into something their own people can see, it's not only that they're making, they're growing, it is above all, that they are recognizing themselves better as a society. And that is also happening progressively, and I, I, I'm not a prophet, I'm just an, an analyst in, in, in some of these things, that will have a huge impact in Africa through the mobile 3G. Because cinema in Africa, and, and it applies to music also, but especially to cinema, because the revolution will be much bigger, Cinema in Africa, of course, the whole audiovisual content was restricted to some very specific places where you could go and watch a movie. And eventually there were DVDs circulating there, which were, of course, all of them Hollywood stuff. But progressively, you know very well that there's a huge development of broadband through mobile broadband in the whole African continent. So films of African creation done by African filmmakers with African stories and sub-African, I'm just making a generalization here, I mean on different parts with different stories, are starting to be distributed and people are watching their own stories. Of course Nigeria is the, the strongest on that and Nollywood is the biggest but it's not only the one. 
because Nollywood can be for some African countries as foreign as as foreign uh, film as others. Huh? But still, uh, it's perhaps not as for as, as as foreign as an Italian film. So indeed, this idea of seeing yourself, of recognizing yourself in in the screen, is something which is extremely interesting. So what's the point? Culture needs an identity, and the identity pushes diversity. So the message is, do not neglect your identity. Do not neglect who you are as a country. And those supporting development, those behind development policies, those drafting developing policies, do not push for those countries to get rid of who they are, of what they do, of how they dance, of their crafts craftsmanship, of their music, of their stories, which will be turned into literature, or into storytelling, or in whatever else. So this is it's a, it, there is a temptation to neglect some social and very rooted identities. Let me go very fast, and then we can open the floor, of course. Very fast to some to some examples where these things are a success. Big or small, it depends, but a success and very, very obvious example. Of course, the first is everything which has to do with folklore. Hmm? I mean, we could talk, and I know that for some people it would sound anathema, but it is not, of the carnival industry in certain countries, which is keeping that alive, which is keeping that alive, which goes far beyond the pure individuals having fun at the end or in a certain period of, 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 of the year. So in Brazil, in Colombia, in Cuba, in Trinidad and Tobago, Tobago, there's a, whole, a huge worth and job creating industry around something as ancient and as out of date with the whole technological culture we live here, uh, uh, which is what we, the carnivals, huh? whatever we can, the, the largest concept of carnivals and everything which happens after uh, around that. It has a huge economic impact in those countries. So it's much more than just a sort of, of, of funny moment. Hmm? And of course, it does have an element. All those elements has uh, a lot to do with the international image, the way you show yourself to the world, and so on. So again, identity, which is one of the basis of diplomacy based on exchange of different identities. Second, the whole issue of cultural heritage. Many examples could be quoted, but the fact that in Peru, for example, in Cusco, they decided that indeed, not only to protect their own identity again, but also as a source of income, they decided to invest some money to protect their own cultural heritage in the city of, of Cusco. And that has created, in terms of local growth, an amazing, I mean, I'm coming to the figures now, but an amazing impact. Some of that is starting to happen, but a much, a much slower s speed as what it could, in Cambodia, for example, in Sim Rep, huh, with the ruins there. But there's a lot to do there. So an investment, and I use the word with all its, its wording, in Cambodia, in culture, could have a huge impact in tourism, which could be an investment in purely uh, income in terms of tourism. Mm -hmm. Around these, of course, you are not only investing in culture, you are indirectly, as a need, uh, in the way that after, in the same way as after a, uh, a sherry comes another sherry. I mean, <laughs> sherries are linked one to the other. Uh, after these sort of cultural heritage investments, of course, you restore the housing around. You dignify the place with the tourist money, properly properly organized and not just left to a sort of uh, uh, chaotic approach, but with, with a plan, with a strategy, you, you end restoring the housing. Of course, you need to restore the communications. You end restoring the whole infrastructure behind that. So, and that starts with this. Other examples uh, of, of this, well, could be in Spain itself, the country I know the most, uh, the Semana Santa, which is in principle a purely religious cultural phenomenon, but at the end it's, it's, it's also money-making machine for lots of people. Uh, and of course it is, a, it is an element which is, is a very important element of stroke there. We could think about Cesaria Ebora, what Cesaria Ebora has brought to Cape Verde, to Cabo Verde. Uh, and we can compare what Sao Tome was some years ago what Cabo Verde was some years ago, and the difference which is now. Is it only Cesaria Ebora's 
result? No. It's definitely many other things. If you don't know Cesare Ebra, you can check it afterwards. Uh, but she's a wonderful singer who died not not long time ago, and who has been the best ambassador of Cabo Verde, so that's cultural diplomacy also, one of the best images of Cabo Verde worldwide. But not only that, she reinforced and she strengthened hugely uh, the music in Cabo Verde, and a specific sort of music, which is, well, a, a local a local dimension. Of course, she had to do that through Paris. We return to the first point. She couldn't do that in Cabo Verde. Nobody invested in recording companies in Cabo Verde, so that took much more time, and they are still there. All that needed to come, giving money, lots of money, of Cabo Verde music to Paris industries. That could have been income for Cabo Verde, everything would be. And the same could apply with Salif Keita in Mali and other very well-known examples. Hmm? So there are certain things which are moving in place. So it's not that everything needs, uh, is happening in Paris and London. Most of it, yes. I wanted to quote a couple of, of, of examples uh, which of things which show that some people are understanding this message. Uh, there's the Biennale of Contemporary Art, African Art of Dakar, Dak Arts, uh, which started in 1992. And it has growing progressively since there. And it is understanding exactly this, especially in this case we are talking about visual arts. Uh, then there's another institution, for example, called the Gara Dance Foundation, based in Nairobi, directed by a choreographer who was trained abroad. And he himself, with the developed of, with support of uh, aid development applied to culture um, from France, mostly, that started like way, he started developing that in Nairobi and training people, and yes, out of something such as dance, well, creating a whole school there. I'm not saying that out of that will come millions to others, but that adds, creates a certain environment out of which all these things can start to happen. Huh? We must finish. Well, I was told this was much longer, but okay, I'm going to finish just a second. Um, many other examples could be quoted with Cuba and its music, of course. We could go for, for long on that. Um, there are many, many other examples. So, I finish. Identity as a source of culture, identity plus diversity means pride, national self-recognition, national better social cohesion, and indeed growth and progress, which was the quadera demonstrandum, as they said the Latins. So what I intended to share with you. Thank you. So does anybody have any questions? Yeah, if we go straight to the back. Thank you very much, Dr. Gardens. Uh, that was a very interesting um, reflection on how culture could be used in an economic way uh, in our discussion today of um, you know, how we deal with sustainable development and uh, all the business uh, models. And we clearly see that culture could be used as a business model as well in a positive way, not on the negative co uh, connotation. My question would be, you talked about the, um, the, um, the identity is important for diversity. Identity needs diversity. So, um, and you presented the Polish case, and I want to bring the, another case uh, which I'm uh, familiar with, it's uh, former Soviet republics, where you have, um, for example, Georgia, a very strong national and Georgian national identity, which left out all the ethnic minorities in Georgia and marginalized these uh, mi minority groups, uh, and then led to a conflict with, that we are uh, experiencing even today with South Ossetia and Abkhazia and um, other um, small um, regions. So could you please reflect on how um, states can use um, their national identity and their diversity as well? how these things could be incorporated. Thank you. Well, that's a very, very good question. I mentioned identity. I didn't say that there needs to be one single identity per country. I didn't say that. I said cultural identities. I said that, uh, I, I say that in opposition to homogeneous thinking, in opposition of getting rid of your own identity just to import somebody else's and just thinking that you know, if you are a minority, because at the end of the day, we are all minorities compared with the American culture. So we are minorities, each one of us. Uh, uh, if we, in terms of cultural industries <laughs> in this context, we are all minority players. Uh, uh, I said 80% of the total 
cinema is Hollywood. If we go to music, it's larger than that. So we are minorities, you know? and we are protecting ourselves as cultural minorities uh, in the, at the world stage. Indeed, within a single state, you can have more than one identity, which means more than one cultural expression. And that's a very long debate, and that has to do with many elements. You quote an example, which I'm not sure is the best for the principle. So I agree with you on the principle. I'm not sure that the case of Georgia is the clearer. Uh, uh, you might have some relationship with them. I don't know why, why you quote that example in particular. But uh, because the, the relationship of Georgia and Russia is has a lot to do with history, and it's, it's not exactly based on, on a cultural issue. Huh? It's, it's on borders, it's on... There, there are different issues. I've been there twice. I, I believe it's much more complicated than that. But in, and, and the Russians, which is also another issue, the Russians, Russians in Georgia are a sort of imported identity and forced imported identity compared to the locals. So it's not exactly the same as you would be talking about people who migrated or people who are there are different identities. I mean, it's, it's really people who are there imported to Georgia, as it happened in other former Soviet republics, precisely to destroy their, the Georgian identity and others. Hmm? Which, of course, children do not need to pay for the guilt of their fathers, and especially of the politicians at the time of their fathers, but it is a day, an element to consider. Hmm? When you think about Russian minorities in Lithuania, well, I'm not supporting some of the policies that the Lithuanian governments have done in terms of identity and culture, but you need to understand that most of those Russians in Lithuania are just the children of people who are forced to move to Lithuania to make Lithuania disappear as a way of just getting rid of that and deleting any resistance of a Catholic Lithuania and just importing people with another culture, another alphabet, and making them forced to settle. Of course, their children have nothing I mean, they cannot pay for that. And they are children of Russian descent, and they feel foreigners in their own in the land where they have been born. So, indeed, that would open a whole debate, which is a very interesting one, on on migration and on identities. In Germany, of course, Germany for many years have has uh, behaved in on denial among its own cultural identity, as if Turkish identity was not German. And Turkish identity is German, and some of the best. Turkish films now are German films done by Turkish filmmakers in Germany. And they are German films representing something which is the conflict of existence and situations coming out of Germany but with a completely Turkish mentality but done and thought in Kreuzberg in Berlin. So you raise, you raise a good point, you raise an important point especially in Europe and not that sure that that applies that much in other places and in developing countries. I think that in some developing countries it is clear that there are certain identities behind uh, the, the borders or sub-identities in tribes and many others in many cases. But that the principle I agree, of course, on the principle that we need. Uh, I am talking about the different identity and the racial expressions or an expression of something which is multi-ethnical, which is in itself also sort of uh, a complex and rich identity. So don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about pure crystal colors. I believe in the, in the mixture of colors, uh, but colors at the end. Okay, colors which are a mix of different colors, but colors, not green. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Straight the front. Yes. Thank you. I am Jana Peri from Finland, but living in Switzerland. Um, can you see a case where the cultural identity or preserving cultural identity would go too far in the case of a country or a region or where you st would start uh, closing the border, so to say, for, from uh, different, imp different other influences? Or the, if you have mi a lot of migrants from other countries so that uh, you don't let them influence your, so to say, pure culture, as cultures are really all, I mean, is there a pure culture? Who can say which culture is pure? It's all changing as, as our environment changes. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm from a Catholic, I come from a Catholic country, and uh, Catholic countries, even those of us who are not Catholic practitioners anymore, we tend to use Catholic metaphors because that's, it helps us. In every Catholic church, when you get in, you have 
in more or less designed ways, blessed water. Hmm? On which you're supposed, the moment you come into the Catholic Church, you're supposed to put your fingers there and to cross your body with that blessed water. There was a debate in the Middle Ages, because blessed water is an amount of water which has been blessed, as simple as that. I mean, there's a moment when that water, it's bottled specially, it needs to be mineral water, not salty water, and the priest blesses that water. And, well, from, this comes from the Middle Ages, and in every Catholic church has that, and even Catholic families in some cases do have a little bit of blessed water. In the Middle Ages, in the times of Ria Scholastica, there was a debate which took books, I mean, uh, books, parts of books and the changes of letters and of, 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 of studies, of saying, well, if in a recipient of blessed water you put a little bit of water which has not been blessed, does the whole remain blessed water? And then theologian, the, I mean, theology exper experts said, yes, it does remain blessed water. So you can add some waters, you can refill a little bit, because, okay, you can refill. But then somebody thought, oh, okay, how many times can you refill until there's no blessed water at all? And the, or the original water, I mean, what is there is not blessed water anymore. And that was a theological debate. Well, what you're raising, it's partly of that theological debate. I mean, how much can a an identity absorb of somebody else's identity before not being the original identity anymore. We can leave that to anthropologists. There is a point in that issue. There is a point that as long as it is done freely, there is a point in protecting identities. So I do believe that there is a point that's not something done coercively, but uh, I do believe there is a point in protecting your own identity in a way you protect species, at least. Cultural identity I'm talking, I'm not blood. This is not about blood. This is about cultural identity, language, certain cultural expressions, folklore, of course, and many others. There is a point on that. To the point of preventing and protecting it pure, no, all identities are, uh, our cultural identities are a sort of melting pot of others. Where is the balance? It's not clear. It very much depends on, on, on countries. The balance would be, of course, to never do things in a forced matter. Hmm? And it is, is very close to the whole migration issue, because you can see it also from the other side. Those who are visiting a country or who have emigrated from the original country for political or for economic reasons, do they have the right to keep their own culture? Yes. Will they bring their own culture as an enrichment to local culture or as a sort of, hey, I don't care at all of the country I'm, I'm coming in. I just remain what I am. And I don't care absolutely about what's going on in this country which has accepted me as new citizen. Well, I don't think that's a model either. What's the balance? We could go on a case by case. So we could debate on this for uh, for ages there's also another element of what you're saying which goes the other way around i mean we're talking about national or cultural uh, culture identities based in a specific space and some sort of cultural pollution and enrichment coming from outside but it also goes the other way around we have that case in with hungary hmm? hungary is protecting its culture and it approved the law to protect hungarian culture wherever it is but of course, Germans do that also, and nobody complains, because it's mostly in countries of German culture, basically, basically a part of Switzerland, of course, uh, Austria, Luxembourg, you could say a little bit. But so that's more or less clear, and if there, if there even been wars before that and treaties. But in the Hungarian case, it's about people moving. So you do have, for example, a huge Hungarian community in Romania which is, in some cases, bunkerizing itself inside Romania, in Hungarian, with support from the Hungarian government. That's also tough, because it's complicated. Of course, Romania has to recognize itself as a bicultural nation, Hungarian and the original Romania. 
But on the other side, I do understand that they are a little bit upset of certain measures, which touch not only culture but also politics, from Hungary, the neighbor, just interfering with their own people and just feeding them as a sort of long arm of their own national identity. So, well, that's Europe. Europe is a very complicated uh, continent. And I just wanted to share the principles, as in anything, when you implement those in very practical terms, you might have difficulties. Okay, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. So if we could just show our thanks to the last speaker of the day, Dr. Ignazia Gwerding.